Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and once again I'm taking you beyond the board this time with some extra special guests, Volko and Andrew Runke, who co-designed Falling Sky, and there was no way I was going to miss a chance to talk about a game about Julius Caesar. How are you gentlemen doing today? Oh, very well. Hi, Liz. Doing great. Thanks for having me. All right, so before we start this conversation, tell me about yourselves. Uh, I'm Volker Runka, creator of the coin series from GMT Games and co-designer of Falling Sky. And I am Andrew Runke, uh, Volko's uh, fortunate son and uh, also co-designer of Falling Sky. Did he say unfortunate? I said fortunate. I said okay. <laughs> Absolutely. So, Andrew, I'm going to start with you because you were really the inspiration for Falling Sky, weren't you? Uh, yeah, I guess, I guess you could say that. <laughs> so what inspired you to make a Caesar board game? Yeah, so it kind of um, actually came about um, from my English class um, in my sophomore year of uh, high school. Um, it was towards the end of the year, and our um, my teacher gave us all an assignment to basically read three books, and we had to write a paper, do an assignment about each of the three. One of the three had to be um, fiction, one had to be nonfiction, and the third one could be just anything, even poetry, just you know, our choice. And I think I, I chose, uh, for my third book, I chose uh, Caesar, uh, Caesar's account of Gaul. Um, and that was by far my favorite. I got really, really into it. And um, then started just tinkering with, uh, I think it was Commands and Colors Ancients, um, Battles, uh, the ones from from Caesar and uh, just kind of changing things. Um, and I think my dad saw that and uh, really wanted to <laughs> design. I mean, we had designed uh, some games before and he really and um, once we got to talking, I think we realized it would be it could be a great coin game. And I think from then on, you know, we really got to work. Volko, had you been reading much Caesar before then or did Andrew get you into it? Oh, An Andrew did. So I only read it after that. And I did it as a, I mean, I read it as we designed as a, it was like a directed reading almost like you might give uh, students a research assignment or something. And the, it, then they're going to read the history in a much more directed way because they're trying to answer certain questions or find certain information or solve certain problems. And this was almost like that. I ended up reading all of it, but it was usually to get more background or this or that that uh, Andrew had put into the design. So that actually leads into a question I had. What um, what non-Caesar sources were you looking at? Or is the game primarily based on his own commentary? So for me, it was based primarily on that. And I did, there was an Education of Caesar was one of the books and maybe a couple of others. And then looking at also as usual, other games as well on the setting. Um, but I'd say far in a way, uh, the, his commentary, his uh, Gallic Wars was the primary source. Was, would you agree, Andrew? I would definitely agree. I think I when like take, for instance, the, the game setup and the, the cards, I was really reading uh, the, the commentaries and basically picking out episodes from that for the cards. And then, you know, we'd go and, and I would, uh, you know, check it with, with uh, other sources and see, you know, maybe what a more, um, you know, unbiased account would be. But, but that was kind of like the Bible for the game um, and, uh, and, and certainly by far the, the, the biggest source. What are your favorite events that you cherry picked from Gallic Wars to put into this game? Just out of curiosity. I think for me... Um, there are kind of two types. The uh, for one, the like the famous uh, capabilities, like the Tenth Legion, Legio Ten, because um, they kind of have such a legend, you know, that that kind of goes beyond um, the reality. And uh, and so making that a card, a capability that was just this super powerful um, 
a thing that gives you know Caesar commanding his legions in battle. Just they're already insanely powerful in the game, but you get this capability, and now they're even more so. Um, and I think the other ones would be uh, the big. There's a f- few sets of cards that that allow for um, kind of very impactful battles. Um, that that are some of them come from the um, the famous battles like the battle at the River Sabbath that allow for for either some sort of unexpected move and battle combination or um or or battles with extra devastating losses and i think for me i I would add to that the idea that i got from from reading his memoir that he was really proud of his diplomatic skills almost maybe more than his generalship he's always bragging about how he had this great network. He knew what was going on in all these various tribes across Gaul and, and he could, you know, manipulate the events and react to uh, that information. And I think those kinds of events, all sort of the skullduggery among um, Caesar and the various Gallic chieftains um, were of great interest because Falling Sky is fundamentally a four player game, meaning it is a war game. There are battles you do march around. But the main route to success is is managing the the other players around the table, and so the way that Caesar talked about his ability to do that, and in just his very description of Gaul being being di- being divided, and every tribe was divided, and every household was divided, and he was going to come in there and take advantage of that, which I guess he did. So is that part of what inspired you to make this game part of the coin series? I mean, I suppose you guys could have designed a game that was just about Julius Caesar that was separate. What made it a good candidate for coin? It was for me. And and it was in the sense that um, Caesar saw resistance to himself as revolt. And whatever you know, we think of that now in terms of was he a legitimate authority marching in there and conquering everything as he did or not, There are characteristics of of the setting that share common principles of um, revolt, internal wars, and even um, expeditionary counterinsurgencies of today. And so for me, I I did like the idea of exploring the topic in that way, which I thought would be a fresh way, but would also be loyal to the the fundamentals of the situation of lots of uh, Gallic factions turned against each other and also trying to resist this foreign conqueror yeah you use the word factions there because i think that's such a you know it's hard to think of gaul without thinking of the word factions and i think that that's true with coin series too that whenever you know i if whenever i see you know a setting where there's there's multiple different factions none of whom you know all of whom are kind of opposed to each other in some ways maybe some of them also are working together in some ways and then they have these different um not only goals but like vastly different methods to achieve that and so you know as soon as as soon as i could kind of put out a map for for how would i break this down into you know a player free for all. Well, we've got the Belgi, we've got the Romans, we have Vercingetorix, and and from there, I think everything else falls into place as far as it coming into the coin system. And and w- one of our first conversations went just like that. I think I remember. I mean, asking, okay, so if we had, you know, let's say we had four players, who would they represent? And you just tick them off, and the A Dewey, and their goal would be this, and the Belgi, and their goal would be this, and the Roman, and so forth. And it was, uh, it came out so naturally that I thought, okay, this has got to be done. <laughs> so were there any mechanical adjustments that you needed to make to your earlier entries in the series to make the coin system apply better to ancient warfare and ancient diplomacy? Uh, many. So uh, f- first off, the um, the four, so liberty or death uh, on the American Revolution was being done at the same time by Harold Buchanan. The four existing volumes at, the, at this time were all set in modern insurgencies. 20th and 21st century uh, insurgencies. And in all those cases, a, a central goal, a pivot point, was controlling population and the sentiments of the population in each region. And we, of course, that's not the way it would work in an ancient tribal society that you'd have to worry about um, uh, every, each, you know, family's personal sentiments. It came down, we thought, to 
tribes and tribal chieftains and the counterpart then to population support or opposition to a government would be an individual tribe or group of tribes and who are they allied with. So you have in Falling Sky with the tribal allies and, and, and suppressed tribal spaces, sort of these disks, you have a pretty different mechanic around which victory turns than in any of the previous volumes for that reason. Yeah, I think another that was definitely one. You know, the, the politics is is a huge one. I think another one was was this was um, one of the more uh, you know military combat focused games in the series. Certainly at that point, point. Um, and you know because it's one thing uh, to it's very different things to be looking for you know terrorist cells or paramilitary you know, groups in an urban or setting in the modern era compared to scouting, you know, several thousand strong standing armies um, to avoid ambush or secure supply lines. Um, and so so with that kind of um, aspect of this is a time period where, you know, several thousand people will stand across from each other and, and, and attack each other. Um, that had to be that had to be taken into account with with how things moved. For instance, you know, in, in previous coin games in the series with like radios and everything, you would just put you know place your march operation or your your move operation in one area, and everyone can zero into that area from the surrounding areas. Where here it was the exact opposite. You would take one big army in one area, and you would starburst out, give everyone different orders, and and move them out there. Um, and then of course the battle mechanics had to be way more. Um, in depth um, and advanced, and to some extent, we had to introduce more uncertainty in the battles. They're still fairly deterministic, but certain certain key dice rolls can can have um, uh, drastic effects when you're attacking legions or citadels, things like that. Um, and so we had we had a, a, a quite a long uh, battle command uh, compared to previous uh, games in the series, also. So one thing that I I like that. I mean, I've only played Liberty or Death, Falling Sky, and Pendragon, so I, I could be wrong about what is present in other <laughs> coin the, games. <laughs> the, the three, the three that happen to have big battles in them. Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> so one thing I really enjoyed, and I'd like to hear you talk more about, was that there are leaders in Falling Sky because mm -hmm. I think one of the things that's the most striking, especially about the Gallic Wars. I mean, of course, Caesar wrote it, so he's the hero. And even though it's in the third person, we know who's going to come out looking the best. But there's also something to be said <laughs> for, um, you know, these sort of charismatic leaders who can turn the tide of battle by sending away their horse and fighting at the front line, by being particularly heroic or inspirational for the people who follow them. So how did you create that feeling in Falling Sky? Well, we tied, we tied the special abilities, which are generally in coin series the the most unique thing a faction can do the thing that they can do that no one else can do um and we tied those to the physical location of the leader if your leader was not there in the battle or your leader was not at that crucial point um, of the map then you would be without your faction's best most unique abilities and these are things like for the romans besieging um, like uh, for for the Gauls um, ambush, which is like one of the most important ways that they could um, safely or at least effectively attack, you know, mass Roman legions. Um, and so so if you were going to be having a one of those big battles, you needed your leader there. Um, and uh, but that but it goes also beyond just the the warfare for for um, political um gathering of allies for the Averni, for instance, versus Gedrix, he he's able to, you know, the, they're, they're the faction that can rally the most um, bodies to their cause, and that's all tied to the location of versus Gedrix, where he is, you're going to be rallying more, you're going to be able to um, entreat uh, and subvert your enemies. Um, and so that, so, so we basically just tied all those abilities to the leader themselves. And, and a, and a part of that, having, introducing leader pieces in Falling Sky where they had not been in the uh, the previous volumes, at least not before Liberty or Death, also is the technology because the Cuban Revolution had Fidel Castro and Che Guevara, sure, but where they were geographically 
um, to me didn't make that much difference because of radio communications. But where in Gaul Caesar was, or where Lerkin Gedrix was, or where Ambiorix was, mattered a, a very great deal to outcomes, it seemed. Yeah, I mean, I know for sure that's true for Caesar. A lot of times I think the Gauls were hoping that he would get wrapped up in Italian politics and not make it back to his troops in time for war season. And of course, winter is something that you also incorporate into the game. Can you all talk to me about that for a second? Uh, sure. Uh, so so that turned out to be the, the interphase, which in previous games had just been called propaganda and tended to be fairly random. In Falling Sky, it happens more or less at the same time. You more or less know how long the campaign year is going to be before Frost hits. And it includes the idea that at this point, Caesar had to go back to, to Cisalpine Gaul, carry out his duties as governor there, uh, usually declaring you know, all Gaul is pacified until there was some you know, revolt again in the spring. And, and similarly, that the, uh, the, the Roman army would go into some kind of bivouac um, in Gaul if and sometimes or sometimes come back to, to Provincia uh, on, on, on more firmly Roman ground. And so that rhythm of the campaign is indeed built in in the winter cards. And there are also as well events, these are other events that I, I, I always thought were fun, um, that have to do with those politics back home that, that you were mentioning, that the, the Gauls were, were, were hoping would draw Caesar and draw the Romans away. So we have Pompey and events in Rome and the like, and a Senate track. And if the, the Roman player, um, for example, gets too many legions killed in Gaul, he can have uh, the political situation back home um, turn, it, turn, against, uh, turn against Caesar. And so that's included in the, in the game as a little bit of a, uh, a side game, but certainly something that the, the Roman faction has to worry about and the Gauls can try to exploit. I think another important thing that the Roman player has to keep in mind, too, with regards to the winter is their supply lines. Because um, if winter comes and they're not in supply and they don't have any friendly allies in the area or, you know, their a Dewey is not able or willing to bail them out uh, with food, then then they might starve. And so and that's something that the Roman player has to even though it might be spring and might be summer, but the Roman player has to be thinking ahead towards the winter and, se and, and secure those supply lines and make sure that when winter comes that they're ready, either because they've they're stocked up on food or they've got some allies or they they've got a clear way to 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 get back uh, to to the province. And that's something that I, I remember. It was an impression on me from the book um, that it, it was an we it was an Oxford um, English translation that we were using. And all through the book, he's talking about corn. Like everybody's had to get corn, and we don't have enough corn. And and <laughs> we didn't bring us our corn. And I'm like, boy, they sure did like corn. Um, and I think it was just, it's, I think it's just fermentum or something. I think it's just grain, yeah. right? Yes. Yeah, uh, but, <laughs> you know, but the point of it is that food for the legions was a bottleneck and had a huge inf influence on the military operations and on the diplomatic relations there and was an, an objective. And so in a way we envisioned the resources in the game, which are fairly generic and coined as a resource track so you can do stuff. That for the Romans, this might represent silver, but it probably princely represents food because they're not in really in the inside the Roman Republic. They're an expeditionary force and they're relying on local sources to feed their troops. And because of that, I, I mean, I was reluctant to have a supply line rule because supply line rules are always tricky and burdensome. I was reluctant to have a supply line rule in a, in a coin series game, but there really was no way to reasonably represent the, that issue. Um, in in Gaul for the Romans without without resort to that kind of rule. Am I correct in remembering that this is also one of the first coin games where it costs more resources to bring an army back together than it does to disperse it to other areas? That's yeah, that is, that is correct. That um, that's what Andrew was mentioning earlier is that in the earlier games I had made it. Um, by destination for moving the cost was by destination and it was the this is the idea that you can um, with radio communications you can easily specify a rally point a, a point in time to, to, to meet and group your people together if you don't have that then the, then the communications are difficult when your units are dispersed 
it's much easier to tell an army that has been pulled together, okay, everybody, you ride north, you ride south, you ride east, and off you go. And so instead, we flipped it to the cost of march was by origin rather than destination for that reason. So this is a question that I wondered about, especially because, you know, De Bello Gallico is the number one source we have for the Gallic Wars. And Caesar himself is so charismatic. How did you bulk out the other factions and give them enough of an identity to make them interesting Mm. to play against someone like Caesar who captures so much intense interest? So my impression of that book, that memoir, is one of the things that makes it great is how much description you get of the of the political environment of the people of the relations for andrew to to read that book and then have in in his mind after that a, a, a systems analysis almost of the interplay of these factions enough to create a simulation that works tells you something about how great that writing was i think we get you know we get to love and hate lots of characters other than caesar in that book so the the um, the character of the the, the Verney led confederation, you know, doggedly fighting against him, the uh, you know, Dividiacus and the Edui, who are so so closely bound in part, but also have all the rivalries within. Some of whom are pro-Roman, some are anti-Roman, uh, find ultimately anti-Roman. Um, the the fierce nature of the the, the Belgae and and how dangerous a uh, foe Ambiorix was on his own ground. I think they come vividly through, so that you, sh- we sure we get a great picture of Caesar from himself, but we get such a vivid um, description of of dynamics. You know, it's not a static scene. There are all these interactions, and you can just see it all working. Yeah, um, I think that was well said. I don't have too much more to add, but I do have. I do remember, just as an example, um, one of my favorite episodes uh, in the book. Now, it's been several years since I've read it, but I think they're they're preparing to fight the Germans, and there are some rumors that break out in the camp that Caesar records about how fearsome the Germans are and how, how scary they are and that a lot of the legions don't want to fight. And Caesar says something along the lines of, well, I if you guys, you don't have to fight if you want me and the 10th legion alone, because the 10th legion, they're never going to back down. We will, we will go by ourselves and and beat them. And I guess that, that as Caesar, you know, accounts that, that perked up the mood. Um, but you get from that a sense that, that there was fear about, about these Germans. And they talked to about the Belgae being like, you know, the closest uh, to Germans that you can get while still being Gauls and, and that they haven't been, you know, that they've denied certain privileges of civilization like wine and that that's led them to be, um, you know, barbarous. And so you can still, you know, maybe you can't, there's not as ample examples as, you know, uh, of character, um, uh, characterizing moments for the, for the different Gallic characters as there are for, for the Romans, but you can, but they're very flavorful when they're there. And then that, those, those kind of episodes, uh, can translate into game mechanics like with the Belgic rampage ability where they just, they just basically scatter enemy forces because you know, they're um, they're so fearsome. Yeah. And, and y'all added touches to the game on the other end as well, um, such as giving trade ability to Rome's frenemies and mm-hmm. also having cards that are about distribution of wine and bringing the treasures of civilization out to pacify potentially unruly Gauls. So, I guess my question is, how seriously did you take Caesar's stereotyping about different Gallic tribes in the actual mechanisms of the game? I mean, I I take them as exaggerations of real things that he was hearing and seeing and encountering. So, for example, I remember there's a story in there, maybe it's about the Germans and you know, they don't cut their facial hair, so their beards grow in front of their mouth and they, they sip their soup through their beard. And I find that scene hard to believe. But <laughs> maybe he thought that was something that the readers back in Rome would, would believe. Probably reflects something about the, the fashions, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the fashions and the appearance of these barbarians to the, to the Romans. 
Um, so I would go, I would do a similar calculus with the Belgi. Uh, I, I don't know why not to take seriously that defending their own ground, that they were not only quite fierce and determined, but also quite clever in their use of the terrain to um, ambush and, and flummox uh, Romans who are, who are far from home and, and unfamiliar. And there, there are scenes in Caesar where y you can see that there were, uh, you know, pro professional forces, uh, legionaries who were undone from a morale perspective when faced with that threat. Um, I don't know if the Romans really believed the Germans were 10 feet tall, but I do believe that the reputation of, of the Germans um, would have been based in, 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 in some experience and would have, would have gotten to the troops. So at a minimum, I find that the, the, the core of these descriptions within the stereotypes to be, to be plausible and really have no reason to reject them. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, there, you definitely have to, you know, read with a critical eye and, um, you know, I, I think what you may have been referencing there is, you know, like a battle of River, River Savis where where they were rushed across the river. Um, and and at least as Caesar recounted, that was a very, very close battle. Of course, in his spin of it, he, you know, like, you know, goes straight to the front lines and that's what what solves everything. But, you know, the uh, behind that, you see that that they really gave them a run for their money um and and so there are there there are greater truths to be found under the stereotyping and the exaggerations i think for sure indeed although i also do find it funny that caesar implies that the belgae are, are more savage in part because they are closer to the germans at least in his characterization <laughs> but also because of that farness from the, the good life that Rome can yes. offer. And his suggestion about that making them less effeminate is also uh, just such a strange <laughs> historical touch. <laughs> so the other aspect that, you know, Caesar is one of our primary sources for, and perhaps we'd not prefer it that way, is uh, Celtic religion. And I noticed that you mm. included Celtic rites as a card in here, but how, what kind of choices did you two make about representation of Druidry within Falling Sky. So for context, for those of you who have not read The Gallic Wars, uh, this is the inspiration for Wicker Man, where Caesar talks about some of their religious practices that include human sacrifice and putting people inside of large wicker models and lighting them on fire. Um, I think uh, for me, the the because there, there are a lot of references to Druids and, and Celtic rites, um, and I, as far as the greater, con the relevance to the greater conflict goes, um, they could, they would be, uh, at, at least as in the account, they would be deciding when and where to fight at points based on, you know, what the druids were saying, you know, what they were scrying, what they were, you know, divining, um, and sometimes that ha that could have serious effects, um, you know, if they if they delayed an attack at at the right moment because the druids said the you know uh, the the omens weren't good and and so i think I, I i never forget what we had for the for for the effect for the card celtic rites but but the idea that that this could have you know actual real impacts uh in the battle in my mind mandated that i make you know i represented in the game somehow and the best way to do that was was with with card events and, you know, my sense of it, both from Caesar and from later Roman campaigns in Britain, for example, the, the principal disadvantage of these Gauls is their division against each other. They didn't see themselves as a Gallic nation or anything like that. They're, they're tribes and confederation of tribes and peoples who are very used to fighting each other and now may or may, may fight the Romans or may ally with the Romans or whatever. And whereas, whereas the Roman Republic uh, for military operations is, is, is quite effectively unified. But the Druids and these aspects of the religion were a potential unifying um, uh, thread 
throughout Gaul. And it, and when Caesar describes that um, the, the 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 Celts would meet at one secret place um, to uh, carry out the religious rites or to talk about these common, more more um, less worldly and more universal aspects of their life as Gauls, um, and that the Druids, um, who are uh, uh, opinion makers of a spiritual nature, but also thereby holding a lot of political clout, well, these Druids might be allied with one another in a greater cause than we're a Verni or we're a Dewey or whatever. And that could be potentially very dangerous for a conqueror and an occupier who is trying to win against vastly superior numbers by keeping those numbers divided against each other. So for me, it was a, a political cultural aspect that Caesar is describing as influencing the nature of the campaign and his own his military challenges that therefore we, we needed to bring into the game. So we've talked a bit about you choosing to include this game in the coin series as a coin game, a game about insurgency. So for you, is this just a game? It was a fun thought experiment. Or do you see Falling Sky as a statement about a way that we could be looking at a historical situation in a historical setting? So I, I hope it will be the, the latter. And I'm not trying to argue myself um, that... Um, ancient Gaul saw insurgency and counterinsurgency in the modern sense. I am suggesting that there are universal aspects of, um, of conquests and of the um, suppression of revolt in an area, including things like the importance of factionalism, um, the importance of uh, regional or local loyalties, um, the, the difficulties of a um, expeditionary force uh, would face in trying to master the, the political and physical landscape of a strange land that, that mean that we can, we can play, let's say, different coin games and then think about, okay, as we've been talking, what are, what's the same in this? What was kept the same? that might suggest at least that the designers see a universal principle at play that transcends the centuries. And what's different? What, 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 cha- what changed that tells us, yes, the similarities are seductive, but the differences are decisive. And, and, then, to, and then to critique that and you know, play the game and say, well, you know, I think this was really force fit and I think we'd underplay this aspect or that aspect uh, of ancient Gaul. And if you're, you know, if, if players are, are, taking it on in that serious way, then I think it, it, the game does have a role to play in helping us uh, think about, you know, dynamics of, of 2000 years ago. Andrew, I know you that you were young when you co-designed this game. And so everyone, Andrew has just graduated from William and Mary. Congratulations, Andrew. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but Thank you. now that you've had a few more years of study on you and just, you know, you're ready to go off into the world, you know, it's a different time in your life. Do you look back on Falling Sky and think about what you might have changed or how it influenced you as a thinker? You know, where are you at with it now? Yeah, well, um, I look back on it very fondly. I think one thing it did for me um, was really help me develop my analytical skills because um, there's it's it's quite a complex thing to 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 test uh, a a multifactional asymmetrical game like this um where you know changing any sort of small balance um, issue in any one of the factions um can just introduce a whole other host of imbalances you never would have even considered um and so so that sort of problem solving puzzling things out um you know designing the board game really is one of the best things I think you can do to to develop that. And, you know, it doesn't even have to be, I think, designing a board game. You can just take a board game that you love and try and just tweak a couple rules or maybe there's a couple things you don't like, maybe the setup and just tweak it and see how the system reacts, how the model reacts, what what changes and, and um, you know, does it work? And I th- so... 
yeah, I, I think it, it was at a point where I was really coming into my kind of in, intellectual own own. It was it was a very prime thing for me to develop um, as a as a person and as a thinker. So I believe you just you told me that you majored in public policy. Do you think that so much exposure to coin games throughout your younger years, um, you're still young, <laughs> has uh, impacted <laughs> your understanding of history and how you read historical accounts now? Or, you know, policy accounts. Yeah, well, I mean, we were talking about, you know, Caesar and, and you know, that's, I think, a very extreme example of, of, of a source you have to read critically. Um, and especially when I'm, I'm really pouring over, over every, literally every sentence, because sometimes these cards that I make, right, are, are, are referencing people that may only have been referenced once or twice in the book, but the very fact that they warranted a mention at all means they probably warrant some sort of card or reference in the game. Um, but so, yeah, going through that so closely um, in such an extreme way is, is definitely helpful for when I'm, um, you know, reading reading accounts or, or uh, you know, in politics all the time, you know, <laughs> the way people talk in politics, it's unfortunately today not necessarily all that different from um, um, how Caesar talked about himself in some ways. Um, so, so it's definitely, uh, it was definitely useful to develop those skills in, 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 in making the board game. So, Andrew, I don't know if you were planning to make more board games or especially more coin games, but I'll ask this to both of you. So I I feel like Falling Sky coming right on the heels of Liberty or Death really opened up the coin system for trying to simulate different eras in time. And of course, we've had Pendragon since. Are there any other historical coins on the on the map right now? Anything coming? There is a, a whole pipeline coming and. Uh, so there are so we are endeavoring with GMT to keep a number of modern actual counterinsurgency topics on the list. So we'll we'll not cut short folks who want to see more of that. But we are um, we've got in work um, things going back in the in the centuries and even one uh, looking ahead to a sci-fi setting. Um, not ready to talk about details about any of those now, but uh, there's a, there's a whole lot in work. You can tell me I'm only media. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, with that, I will end this conversation, but before we cut it off, gentlemen, where can we find you on the internet? If you want to be found. <laughs> so you can uh, find me most easily on Twitter at Volco two six. And for me, uh, email is probably the best way uh, to reach me, and that would be afrunke at gmail.com. So A-F-R-U-H-N-K-E at gmail.com. Thank you so much for coming on, gentlemen. Thanks for listening, everyone else, and happy gaming. Thank you. This was great fun. Thank you.